That's what our focus is today. Happy Resurrection Weekend. I mean that very sincerely. I hope that uh, these last few days have been times of renewal. While the story may not be new, God wants to renew himself in our lives each day. And as we rehearse this story of Jesus' last week, his death, his resurrection, we are enlivened, we are changed. You know, the last uh, several times I've been speaking to you, I've been involved in a series on the blessing of God and how that all happens. Not going to be doing any of that today. We'll catch up with that another time. Today we're going to be specifically focusing on the cross. Now, um, I have to tell you, in years past, I've always had a very narrow focus. I've uh, spoken perhaps uh, on the resurrection or we've talked about what it was like when Jesus was in the grave and what all that meant. We talked about the uh, Last Supper. We've talked about the triumphal entry there. Today I want to focus specifically on something that happened on the cross. In fact, seven somethings that happened, seven victories of Jesus. We're told to behold the Lamb. And I hope that as you've been taking some extra time this week beholding the Lamb, that as the Bible says, you become changed. By beholding, we become changed. You remember last week, I spoke specifically about that feast of Simon, Simon the leper on Saturday afternoon. And we sit, talked about how the, uh, the beautiful emblem of Mary's faith that spike nard was poured, poured over the head and uh, beard and hands and chest and feet of Jesus there. That uh, smell of her faith that uh, went all through that week with Jesus. It couldn't really even be washed off. And even on the cross, he was smelling that, that faith. But today we're going to look at a, some very select words of Jesus. Jesus' last hours on the cross Words of victory, every one of them. Words that still down through all the ages speak to us today. Words that are eternal, that speak to us of victory for us today. And so before we go farther, please pray with me, Lord. Lord, we just ask, Lord, that as your scripture is shared today, and as your Holy Spirit moves, that your words be heard and only yours. Oh God, I don't know that I can do it justice. Lord, these, these incredible victories that you won, Lord, help me to say it in a way, Lord, that will prick our hearts to help us just as a glimpse of what truly happened those moments long ago. And so, Lord, we ask your Holy Spirit to control all that happens here today, and we thank you for that ministry we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Most Christians I know live defeated lives. Not in all areas, just one or two usually. Defeated lives, areas of weakness. But Jesus doesn't want to give us defeated lives in any areas of weakness. In fact, in every area, Jesus overcame. Jesus overcame sin. Jesus overcame every temptation. Jesus overcame even the results of sin. Jesus overcame the traumas that sin caused. Jesus overcame the pain that sin caused. Jesus does not want to have us to live in any way defeated because he was victorious. Jesus was victorious over every single thing the devil could throw at him. The devil was totally defeated. You know... If we choose him each day, we can live in that victory too. I've had the privilege of being with a number of friends and to hear their dying words. Um, sometimes right away, sometimes right before death, sometimes um, before comas. And when I've heard those words, I always recognize it as a privilege. When a person has very little time left to live and they are aware, the words that they say 
are very poignant. They're full of emotion. They're full of meaning because they are something that w needs to be said that's weighing on their heart. Last words. There are several books that you can buy that tell you stories of famous people's last words, and I thought I'd share a couple of them with you. Uh, some are a little more meaningful than others, um, but just listen. Uh, here's probably one of the more famous ones. The two words that our second president, John Adams, voiced with his dying breath. He said, Jefferson lives. Unfortunately, Thomas Jefferson had died the exact same day, just a couple hours earlier. Here's one. You ever heard of Aleister Crowley, the famous occultist, the Satanist, and so on? And as he was taking his dying breath, I think he realized that the enemy had played a trick on him. His words were, I am perplexed. Satan, get out. Winston Churchill's last words were that famous leader of Britain during World War II and afterwards. His famous words were, I'm bored with it all. This is his last words. Here's one, a movie star of a generation ago. Anybody remember Bing Crosby? The last words were, that was a great game of golf. He was a famous golfer. John Quincy Adams, also a president of the United States, an outspoken Christian and a, and a president who was involved in the Great Awakening, the Advent Movement, during his time in the 1830s and 40s. His last words were, this is the last of earth and I am content. There's a Christian for you. Done with the earth, he's still content. Princess Diana, in that car wreck a few years ago, last words, oh my God, what happened? Interesting words, just two more. The Roman Emperor Julian, not our Julian, <laughs> the Roman Emperor Julian, after having attempted to reverse the official recognition or endorsement of Christianity, his last words, he was so frustrated, trying to stamp out Christianity, his last words on his deathbed, you have won, O Galilean. And then one of my personal favorites, because I've probably read all our books, Corey Ten Boom, the Christian evangelist who survived the uh, concentration camp, Robinsbrook, during World War II, and tramped all over the world telling people, um, her last words were, Jesus is victor. Jesus is victor. Yes, Jesus is victor. And let's take a look at some power-filled words of Jesus about his victory on the cross. Now, while Jesus was on the cross, I would remind you that his every word was painful. I'm talking physically painful. Remember, the cross was an instrument of torture. In fact, um, one of the ways that it tortured a person was by asphyxiation. You had to literally lift yourself up upon the nails that were driven through the heels to be able to take every breath and then to exhale. It was meant to be an instrument of torture. And so just to get the words out, you're obviously in shock, you're exhausted, just to get any words out are unique and meaningful. Jesus chose his words oh so carefully. And I'm going to go through them in order with you, but first of all, I want to tell you one more thing. There are two types of pain. There's physical pain and there's emotional pain, and you know the difference. You have had pain and, and you know, you take an aspirin or whatever and, and you deal with that. But emotional pain is different. You can go through emotional pain, have a good night's sleep, and wake up the next morning and be totally exhausted because it's so much more than physical. It's emotional. Jesus' physical pain was real, and it's easy to focus on them, the scourging, 
the crown of thorns, the beatings that he had received from the soldiers, the exhausted walk of uh, the way to, to Golgotha, the very cross itself, his hands nailed, his feet, his heels nailed to the cross. All those are physical pain, surely. But I would also remind you of the emotional pain that he is going through. As Jesus became sin for us, which of necessity then separated him from the beloved Father. You remember he began to feel this there at Gethsemane, so much so that he sweat great drops of blood. The emotional pain of separation was extreme. Jesus suffering the very second death that should have been ours, separation from God. And then what about the emotional pain of denial? The denial of every one of his disciples that ran away, every one. The betrayal of Judas. I think Jesus loved Judas, but he betrayed him. Silver, a few pieces of silver. The very rejection of a whole nation. A week before that Sunday, Jesus stood on the Mount of Olives. They were crying, save us from the Romans. And Jesus wept because he was being rejected by the nation that he came to save and a people. Emotional pain is so much more worse than physical pain. Uh, during these moments, angels veiled their faces. They refused to look upon the prince of the universe, the captain and all the angelic hosts. Even the sun refused to shine those last three hours while Jesus was on the cross. But for a few moments, we need to peek. We need to look. We need to hear his words. And so I'd like you to look at our first scripture. It's found in Luke 23, just verses 33 and 34. Luke 23, 33 and 34. And when they came to the place where it is called the skull, a cavalry, some of your Bibles say, Golgotha, there they crucified him and the criminals on one on the right and one on the left. And Jesus said, Father, Forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. It's interesting that John alone records this. The other gospel writers do not. John realized that it had been left out. Remember, he was an eyewitness. He was there at the cross. And John heard these words in amazement. And as John re recognized that the other gospel writers who had written down the story of Jesus the cross had forgotten this key component that started it all, he wrote it in his gospel. Certainly Jesus was speaking to the soldiers around him. Certainly he was speaking to the religious leaders who were hurling their insults at him. Certainly he was speaking to others who heard him surrounding the cross. Forgive them, they don't know what they are doing. We have so little idea of what sin cost. We don't have hardly a clue what sin had cost. What it cost God, the terrible results it cost. If we did, we would not sin so easily because sin hurts. Sin costs everything. But Jesus offered up his forgiveness. Jesus gives it freely, and as we begin to accept that, one of the things that happens as a result is we are able to forgive ourselves. And let me tell you, you can't forgive anybody else unless you first forgive yourself. There's an awful lot of people walking around in unforgiveness inwardly. You know what I'm talking about. You've seen people who live shame-debased lives, people who are always apologizing, who are always you know, uh, trying to make up for something. People who, uh, because they're walking in unforgiveness, they tend to lash out at others. They're trying to control. They're trying to manipulate others. These are the same people who often love to point fingers at others, who criticize others. But you know, when we truly realize that we are forgiven, then and only then can we forgive someone else. How can we not forgive when we realize how much, 
God has forgiven us. Jesus' victory on the cross, the victory of forgiveness, is our entryway, is our ticket into the kingdom of God. Jesus even taught us to pray, Father, forgive us our sins as we forgive others. In Matthew 6, 14, Jesus says, we for, Father, forgive us our sins Forgive, forgive others their sins and your heavenly Father will forgive your sins. But we struggle with forgiveness. Those who have really wronged us, again, the simple fact is we cannot truly forgive unless we first accept the forgiveness of Jesus. He alone won that victory. You can try. You can say, I'm going to forgive this person that's hurt me, that's caused me this trauma, that wasn't enough, who did this to me. You can try. You can grit your teeth. You can pray for strength, and none of it's ever going to happen unless you accept the victory that Jesus has already won. He alone can give you forgiveness because he alone has conquered all sin, every temptation, every trauma. So if you're struggling with forgiveness, what you're really struggling with is accepting Jesus' forgiveness. Our second words of Jesus, again, full of meaning, are found also in Luke 23. And it's a little longer section, starting with verse 39. All the gospel stories tell us this. One of the criminals who was hanging and the cross railed at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Don't you fear God, since you're under the same sentence of condemnation? And we are indeed justly, for we have received the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he, Jesus, said to him, Truly I say unto you today, you'll be with me in paradise. Those words, you will be with me in paradise. Now, think for a minute. They're amazing. What did that thief do to qualify? Hmm. Was it his last robbery? Was it the fact that he just happened to be crucified next to Jesus? Maybe he offered a bribe to pay off God. Well, all those things are ridiculous, aren't they? That's not why Jesus said that. In fact, it was simply his faith. He reached out in faith to Jesus. He recognized the king of heaven right next to him, about to take his rightful place in God's kingdom. He said, your kingdom. And he simply asked to be remembered. That's it. Nothing more. He didn't appease God. He didn't pay off God. He didn't talk about past sins or righteousness or victory over sin. He simply said, remember me. But I would also remind you that it took real effort for the thief to do that because he too was being crucified. He too was in shock. He too had to lift himself up to take every breath and to utter those words. I love um, what Luke 15 tells us. You won't, we won't turn there. It's not on your screen. Luke 15 verses 1 and 2 tells us that Jesus loved to be with sinners. I think sometimes he may have loved to be with sinners more than the righteous, quote-unquote. Tells us that the tax collectors and the sinner, sinners were coming to him because they wanted to listen to Jesus. And, of course, the Pharisees were there pointing their fingers, you know, because he welcomed sinners. Don't you like the fact that Jesus loved to be with sinners? Because that's where I walk. Jesus didn't make irreligious, non-religious people, sinners, feel small. 
Jesus didn't wag his finger at them. Jesus welcomed sinners because he wanted to un them to understand that even though they were born with three strikes against him, even though they were born with a nature that wants to sin given half a choice, even then, God welcomes sinners. And so, as Jesus said those words, you'll be with me in paradise, he pulls up an old Persian word, a Farsi word, that word paradise. It means garden of God. Hmm. Paradise, garden of God. You'll be with me in paradise. Notice these words are the victory of assurance. These words are the victory of assurance over doubt. You will be with me. Assurance. You may know that you have eternal life not because you have appeased God, not because you have been good enough. So many people have told me over and over again, when I get good enough, then I will. Then I'll be serving God. I'll be baptized. I'll whatever. No, you'll never be good enough. Notice Jesus was a words of assurance over doubt. Not because you are righteous, not because you are right, not because you're good enough, simply because you reach out to Jesus. That's it. Nothing more. You may know because the Jesus that victory won, the victory that Jesus won, you may know that you have eternal life. You don't have to doubt it. You don't have to walk around worried about it. You do not have to walk in fear. If you are living a fear-based life, I know that you haven't met the perfect love of Jesus. It's really that simple. Because as we accept his victory, all fear le leaves in the light of his love. Doubt gives way to security. Striving and legalism, they give way to rest. Worry, anxiety, no, they're swallowed up with God's peace. So many people who walk in fear, that stinks. That's a stinking life to live that way as a Christian. Believers, the next time the enemy wants to whisper in your ear that you are living a life of fear, remember that he's a liar. He's a liar from the beginning, but all he knows how to do is lie and steal and destroy. Don't listen to him. Never listen to those words. You can have assurance, not because of you, but in spite of you, but because of Jesus. If even one person here today is walking in fear and doubt, I would ask you not to leave this room without assurance. And if you want somebody to privately talk with you, we'll do it right after service with you as we pray with you. But you can choose right now. And Jesus can give you that assurance right this moment. Our third word of Jesus is found in the book of John, John chapter 19. And in John 19, verse 25, we see the absolute only mention anywhere in the Bible of Mary, the mother of Jesus, concerning the Passion Week. Now, unfortunately, some of you have watched a film called The Passion or had the, maybe heard the Catholic idea that Mary is a redemptress, you know, and that she is Savior as well. That's not true. This is the only place it's even mentioned. And notice Jesus' words in John 19. And we're going to start with verse 25, just a couple of verses here. John 19, 25, so the soldiers did this, but standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister and Mary, the wife of Cleopas, and Mary Magdalene. Boy, there was a lot of Marys in those days. By the way, the Hebrew was Miriam. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved, that's John who's writing this, and the disciple whom he loved standing near, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. And then he said to his disciple, behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. 
Now, not only is this the only indication of Mary, but we have an, a slightly earlier indication before the Passion Week, which is, not, which is not commonly spoken about. In fact, Jesus is rebuking his mother. He is rebuking his brothers and sisters. In fact, you remember that they came to Jesus. They wanted him to compromise. They wanted him to make nice with the leaders down in Jerusalem. And Jesus said, who are my mother? Who is my father? Who are my brothers and sisters? They that do the will of my father in heaven, they are my mother, my brother, and my sisters. You see, Jesus was unwilling to compromise even for his mom. I want you to notice, however, that in this victory, that is a, in a victory in the midst of a somewhat, it's going to trouble you perhaps, a somewhat dysfunctional family. Hmm. A family that was asking him to compromise with God. I wonder, relatives, don't you just love them? I heard some of you start to laugh. You love all your relatives, right? How many love all your relatives? Okay, how many have just lied? <laughs> you, you don't have any black sheep in your family? Some, do you don't have a relative that's hard to get along with? The fact is, most of our families are at least somewhat dysfunctional. And I would be willing to bet that there's hardly a family represented here where everyone is faithfully serving God. There's probably compromises all over the place. Jesus overcame the unrighteous pull of family relationships that might cause a person to compromise his faith and lessen his walk with God. I've seen it over and over. Husbands who compromise their faith for their God, with God. Wives who compromise their faith with God for their husband. Children who will give up this because their parents are making it hard upon them and they'll give up on God. Jesus properly cared for his mother. Probably Father Joseph was dead by this time. His brothers perhaps weren't very trustworthy. By asking John to care for his mother, he was not only doing his familiar duty, but he was trusting his family to God's great love. You see, he chose the one person, John, who loved him the most. And by trusting his mother to John, the beloved disciple, he's trusting his mom to God. The most precious gift we can give our family, our children, is to entrust them to God. Pray for them daily. To not try to fix everything in our family, but to trust them to God. To reach up in faith to God with them. Folks, your families are not fixable without God. So many of us try to. If you've had trouble with your family, and I ask you if you did, and I think all of us could raise our hand, it's just like breathing, are you willing to trust God with that family member, with that loved one, with that child who's not following God closely? When they struggle with sin, when your family member disappoints you, when they're ill, that's when trusting is hard. Are you willing to pray for them and commit them to God? Are you willing to do as Jesus did, to grab hold of the victory with family? And he won it. He won that victory even with his family. Jesus' victory in our families opens us, us up also to a whole new family, the family of God. Go to the book of Mark, if you will. Mark chapter 15, one of my favorites. Every time I look at this, I see more and more. Mark chapter 15, 
going to look at verse 33 through 35. Mark 15, 33 to 40, 35. And when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. That's three o'clock in the afternoon. So from 12 to 3, it's dark. At the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, behold, he's calling on Elijah. No, he wasn't calling on Elijah. For three hours, darkness covered the land. The sun refused to shine, and very mercifully, the final agonies, the final suffering, the final separation from God, as Jesus became sin for every man, was hidden. It was hidden as sin was separating him from his Father. These words of Jesus were not words of doubt. These words of Jesus were not questionings, as some have suggested. Every time I hear that, I want to scream. It's the exact opposite. At the very darkest point, both physically, emotionally, the very salvation of all of humankind is hanging in the balance. At the darkest moment of his very life, Jesus cries out in faith and quotes Scripture. The scripture is that scripture, I've shared this before, is the first line of a psalm that every single one around the cross knew. You see, Psalms 22 starts out with this line. The scripture was quoted every single day at nine o'clock in the morning, just so happens to be the same time that Jesus was crucified. At every morning sacrifice in the temple, Psalms 22 was read, was sung actually. Everybody knew Psalms 22, day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, everybody knew it. This was not rocket science, folks. And so when Jesus cries out this great, these great words, they immediately begin to think about Psalms 22. And they recognize that the very words that are being hurled up at Jesus were quoted in Psalms 22. They recognize that Psalms 22 tells them about their piercing his hand. They recognize how they gather around the cross and mock him. They recognize how Psalms 22 tells them the story that the soldiers are there gambling for his garments at the foot of the cross there. They recognize everything as he cries out to God. And Jesus in faith is quoting that scripture drawing their attention like a laser down through the ages to us as well. Jesus was not dying in doubt. Jesus was dying in faith. He was pointing to the promises of Scripture, what David had written a thousand years earlier. It was on his very breath. It was on his mind. And he wanted you and I there too. In the darkest moments of your life, do you quote scripture? Do you hang on to the promises of God? Or do you focus elsewhere? You see, this is a man who won the victory of faith in those dark, dark moments. Oh, the word of God, the promises of God are so valuable. Will you trust God's promises written in his word? When the circumstance shout at you, to believe everything else? Will you trust God when others forsake you? Will you trust God when you have every reason to doubt? Or will you grab hold of the victory that Jesus already won on the cross and trust in faith the words of Scripture, the words that God himself, that Jesus himself breathed to the prophets that you and I may know for certainty what really is truth. I love that word and that victory of Jesus. The words of God alone. Let's look at another, John 19. And in John 19, back in John 19 again, we see a simple two-word statement. John 19, 28 and 29. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, uh, said, notice these words, to fulfill scripture, I thirst. 
I thirst. I thirst? That seems out of place, doesn't it? In the midst of all these other dramatic statements that are going on and everything else that's happening, I thirst. Well, I imagine he was thirsty. You know, a lot of loss of a lot of blood, trauma, shock. But why now? Why there? I thirst seems so small. However, if you notice in Matthew 27, 34, Matthew tells us that they offered him wine mixed with gall and he would not drink it. Hmm. Wine mixed with gall. It's a kind of like a drug. And he wouldn't drink it. Now, the Roman soldiers had this. This was a common thing. You see, when somebody was being crucified, they were in physical pain. And so what they would do is give them wine and gall that would lessen the pain. And because the pain would lessen, they would actually be on the cross a little longer. Wasn't that nice of the Roman soldiers? I'm being facetious, of course. But notice Jesus refused it. He refused something to deaden the pain. Jesus refused the drug that was offered to him. Jesus refused the easy way out. A lot of people today do not. Drugs, alcohol, food, substance abuse, self-medication, different ways to deal with the pain. But the simple fact is Jesus refused it. He wanted to be clear-headed. The most important battle of the universe was going on. In no way is he going to accept some wine and some gall. Jesus intentionally chose the pain rather than to selfishly satisfy his own needs. We just read in John that John said, so that the scripture might be fulfilled. Well, so doesn't that make you automatically think, what scripture? What scripture is being fulfilled? And it's very simple. Psalms 69 verse 21 says that it was all part of God's plan and that this would happen and that Jesus would refuse. I wonder perhaps if there wasn't one more scripture in Jesus' mind. It's a scripture that you all know. It's also from the Psalms, Psalms 42. Psalms 42, verses 1 and 2. As the deer pants for the water brook, so my soul longs after you, O God. You sung it? We know that song, don't we? Can you imagine Jesus saying, I thirst? Do you think he was really worried about a drink of water? I bet he was thinking about the deer who pants for the water brook and him, his whole being reaching out to God. What a victory. What a victory. Thank you, Lord. Back to Luke again, 23. In Luke 23, we see his next words, almost his last, Luke 23, 44. Now it was about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And while the sun's light failed, the curtain in the temple was torn in two. And then Jesus, crying out with a loud voice, says, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. He breathed his last. Some of your Bible says he gave up the spirit, which is actually a more correct translation. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. You know, as believers, we can have that same victory because every day we need to die. We need to choose to die and commend our spirit, our life, the very breath that God gives us to God. You can live on your own and then end up dead, or you can die and be resurrected in new life to Jesus. 
but you can't have them both. You can't. It just doesn't work that way. We have to either commend our life to God or we run it ourselves. And every day that's a choice that we make. You know, um, I love the fact that it says the temple curtain at this same moment was torn top to bottom. Now I want you to think about that for a moment. We know a lot of things about this curtain. First of all, it was 18 inches thick. That what the Mishnah tells us that when, and when the temple was rebuilt and when they put it between the holy and the most holy place, it was so heavy that it took 200 men to lift it. Okay, so we're not talking about some tiny little veil. Okay, we think of a veil like a bride wades, wears or something. No, 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 not like that. So this is torn top to bottom. And you may remember that the temple, the, the, those two compartments inside the temple represented something. There was the holy place, and this represented sanctification or growing up in God. And then there was the most holy place that represented glorification or the very visible presence and dwelling with God. Now please notice what happens as Jesus dies. The veil is opened. The veil is opened. It's torn top to bottom. It's open showing that there is no longer sep any separation between us and our God. There is no longer even a separation between the sanctification and growing with God and being with God. In fact, God will be with us and be in us. And that we can come boldly to the throne. We don't have to stand outside a veil. We don't have to stand outside a temple. We don't have to stand in a certain court. No, we can stand right there with Jesus. We can stand at the right hand of the Father. We can come boldly and we can know that we are heard. Because Jesus commended his life to God. His victory can be yours. You don't have to even have anybody take you there. I have people all the time ask me to pray for them, and I'm always glad to do it. But folks, I'm just a person like you, and you can pray too. You have just as much access as I do. There is not a one of you that doesn't have the same access or maybe even more because Jesus gave it to you already. When Jesus died... God was showing in a very physical way there was no longer any more separation. Jesus' last thoughts, I think, also are echoed here. I want to share a scripture with you. It's not up on your screen, but I'm going to read it to you that you're probably not aware of. You may not realize that once again, Jesus is quoting scripture. When Jesus quotes scripture, it means something. Okay? Don't miss it. Jesus is quoting scripture. I'm going to Psalms 31, verses 1 to 5, and just hear these words as I share them with you. It's not on the screen. Hear these words and see if it doesn't speak to you about the cross and Jesus on the cross here. In thee, O Lord, do I seek refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In thy righteous deliver me, incline thine ear to me, rescue me speedily, be thou the rock. Be the refuge for me. Be the strong fortress. Save me. Yea, though you are the rock and my fortress, for your name's sake, lead me and guide me. Take me out of the net which is hidden for me, for you are my refuge. Into your hands I commend my spirit. You have redeemed, O Lord and faithful God. Those marvelous words. You have redeemed, O faithful God. Into your hands I commend my spirit. I just can imagine Jesus mouthing the words, thinking these words, his last moments on the cross. Powerful, powerful psalm. And then, of course, his last words. Again, we'll go back to John. John 19, 30. You know what they are. Very simple words. Verse 30 of chapter 19 in John, when Jesus received the vinegar and said, it is finished, he bowed his head, he gave up his spirit. Notice, he gave it up. 
He didn't die by nails. He didn't die with a spear. He didn't die from shock and exposure. Jesus chose. He gave it up. He willingly gave up the very life force, the spirit, the breath of God that he gave. He gave it up for us, and he did it with the final words, it is finished. It's done. It's finished. But now, when the skeptic looks at that, they always ask two questions. What's finished? And if everything's finished, why are we still here? Those are good questions. Those are honest questions that should be answered. First of all, it was finished. Jesus didn't lie. Jesus did everything necessary to fully redeem, to fully rebuild, to fully save every human being who wants it, without exception. He finished his work. The work on the cross, there is nothing that is ever added to it. You can't add anything. I cannot tell you how many times I've been in a counseling session or talked with a person and had to tell them, you need to get down off the cross and let Jesus save you by himself. Because we all want to put in our own 10 cents worth. We all think that Jesus somehow needs help. No, Jesus finished the work completely and fully. But if he did, why are we still here? It's not because Jesus didn't finish the work. It is very simply that what Jesus did finish has not yet been applied by faith among his people. You see, the finished work of Jesus, we by faith have to reach out and take hold of before Jesus comes again. Jesus' work was completed on the cross. His work, his victories were complete for fallen humanity. What is not finished is our faith towards him. As we grab hold by faith of Jesus' finished work, we will then stop trying to help God. Also, we'll stop pointing our own legalistic fingers at others. But I said there were seven words on the cross. There's actually one more word. It's right after the cross. The words of Jesus that a lot of people miss. John chapter 20, verses 4 and 5. They're at the tomb here. Mary of Magdala has come. Simon Peter's also in the area, and John. And verse 4 says, And they both ran, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first, and stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. He did not go in. And then let's skip down to verses 14 and 15. Mary now is in the garden, and notice what she's looking for. She's saying this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she didn't know that it was Jesus. Verse 15 said, Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom do you seek? And supposing him to be a gardener, she said, Sir, if you've, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've laid him, that I may take him away. They've looked in the tomb. They see the folded grave cloth. Mary's wandering around in this garden area around the tomb. She runs into Jesus. She doesn't even recognize him. She thinks he's a gardener. First time I read that, I thought, I know there's a reason I like gardening. And then... Jesus says to her those powerful words, Whom do you seek? Please notice, the resurrected Jesus was standing right in front of her. The one disciple that probably had the greatest faith and maybe loved Jesus the most, and she didn't even recognize him. She didn't catch that it was Jesus. And so Jesus asked a very simple question. Whom do you seek? Mary was looking for a dead body. She didn't even recognize Jesus. And Jesus once again asked that resurrection question. Whom do you seek? Right now, I want you to put yourself next to the tomb of the resurrected Jesus. 
want you to imagine yourself looking in that tomb and seeing those folded grave clothes as they lay there. Perhaps you can smell the, the spices that were used for his burial. We're told that Nicodemus brought a hundred pounds of aloe. Yeah, that's a lot of spices there. Perhaps you can imagine yourself listening to the angel words even. He is risen. Why are you looking among the dead for he is risen? And then you hear Jesus' words as Mary heard. Whom do you seek? Whom do you seek? Whom do you seek? And as those words fall upon you, suddenly you recognize that this isn't just some gardener. This is Jesus. You see, it is the question that Jesus still asks today. Whom do you seek? Do you seek after self-made answers? You know, the ones we come up with ourselves. Do you seek after the arm of flesh, somebody else to help you? Whom do you seek? Do you seek after other gods of your own making? Whom do you seek? When we have seen the victories that Jesus won on the cross, and we've illuminated seven of them now, his life, his resurrection, the new life that he wants to give, the new life that he offers, he again down through the ages asked the same question to you and I, whom do you seek? Whom do you seek? Jesus is standing right next to you this very moment asking that question, whom do you seek? Please pray with me. Our Father in heaven, I stand amazed as I see the victories of Jesus. And we come as your people totally unworthy, but seeking your face. And Lord, as we seek your face, Rip every other image from our mind but yours. Help us to forget others who we rely on, gods of our own making or self-focus that always leads us astray, but to only and always to focus upon you. Lord, the very victories that you won, the seven that we have enumerated today, are powerful and precious to us. Lord, you've already won them. All we have to do is accept them. And we stand amazed at such love and the offer that is given to us. And Lord, as we see you once again on that cross, we are reminded that you look down through the ages at our face the very purchase of your blood and you smiled as you thought of the possibility that we would choose you. Lord, we want to come to you today and said, yes, Lord, we seek you today. Amen. Let's... Um,